Welcome to the latest episode from Isolation to Inspiration. This podcast is conceived so that Paul Boros and I can meet with motivational leaders to get a fresh perspective on the current state of the world whilst learning and laughing. Our guest on this edition of From Isolation to Inspiration is a multi-award winning magician, comedian, actor, writer and corporate presenter. He has performed in over 30 countries in every conceivable location, from the London Palladium to the jungles of Belize, and from the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas to the back of a truck in a Bosnian war zone. He has literally hundreds of television appearances to his names, including being the originator of street magic with three top-rating, hour-long, one-man primetime specials. He's also known as one of the world's leading paranormal skeptics, which is probably not surprising to horoscope enthusiasts, given that his star sign is cancer. Mm-hmm. Paul Zenon, welcome to From Isolation to Inspiration. Thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs> it's very nice to have you. Now, as a magician and a comedian and an Did you actor. Write that? <laughs> None of it sounds familiar. <laughs> all written by me um as a magician and a comedian and an actor it must be a very difficult time during lockdown to to find stuff to do so what have you been up to um well i, I first actually embraced the not performing things i realized it was the first time in maybe uh, 40 years that you know i haven't actually um, been in front of an audience so what I started doing, you know, and uh, as you know, in the UK on Thursday evenings, they have the, uh, the eight o'clock applause for the National Health Service on the doorsteps. So what I started doing now is going out about five to eight on a Thursday and just doing a little trick or a little joke and then soaking up the applause after that, you know, <laughs> just to get that little taste. Um, nice but apart from that, I mean, uh, I've, I've actually, um, I've got a little exclusive for you. One thing I've been up to, and I, I only realised uh, this afternoon, that uh, I, I started making some home-brewed wine. I started uh, some wine making, um, and it's ready today, a bit. Uh, and I genuinely haven't tried this at all. This, so this is, uh, it went in a month today. You're supposed to leave it at least three weeks or whatever. So uh, don't, I won't do the comedy splutter uh, regardless, but, uh, but cheers, it's, it's to isolation. Yeah. Cheers. Um, I wish we could join you. It's actually not bad. It's 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 like uh, it was supposed to be red wine. It's more like a rosé, but it's, it's that will definitely uh, sustain my borderline functioning alcoholic um, situation. It reminds me of the Monty Python line, which is, "This is not a wine for drinking. This is a <laughs> wine for laying down and avoiding." <laughs> Well, I think, yeah, I'll be laying down regardless after that, I think. But that's actually pleasantly surprised, bearing in mind that I've got about four gallons of it. <laughs> well, I think... Yeah, it must, sorry, I was going to say that I think, I think it's, uh, it's, probably, it's probably been a magical time for a lot of people um, to stay at home. And, and, and to, So when it comes down to a lot of the things that you've learned over the years, I mean, do, do you practice? I mean, sorry, you froze up. Are you, bring, are, are you bringing new techniques in? Are you practicing new things? Paul, um, you're taking this downtime to to come up with new tricks. Learn new you things. know what? I, I really haven't done as yet. Uh, it's basically just the past week because it's going to be a, you know quite a while before anybody's uh, performing again. I can't see people wanting to sit next to each other in a you know you know confined space in a theatre or, or a comedy club or whatever for quite a while yet. So there's no panic on it. But it suddenly occurred to me that kind of magicians are in a kind of uh, difficult situation even compared to comedians or singers or whatever because it involves audience interaction, you know, physical interaction where you can, you're getting some up from the audience, um, you're um, borrowing a, you know, a banknote from them or borrowing their watch or getting them to choose a card. People aren't going to want to do that. So I'm actually going to have to change the approach. And I worked out just, just recently about 80% of my material involves some interaction. You know, other than just talking to the audience. 
So actually, I think a lot of people, a lot of magicians are going to have to come up with or anything or creating new tricks as such. It's just adapting the stuff you've got, you know. So, I mean, for example, rather than someone physically taking a card, you might have to riffle through the pack of cards and say, stop me at any time, all that kind of thing. Um, but what I have noticed is there's a few people actually using the Zoom uh, medium um, to, to, to do magic on. And in some ways, it kind of makes it kind of easier to do tricks in some respects, you know, because you kind of, you, know, you hold an object up or whatever and you go, Oh, and it's vanished. You know, you just use the uh, preceding march of the screen, basically. You know? I love it, and, and, and I suppose I suppose it's not funny if you if, if you're on the stage and you say, "Are you coffee? You look a bit poorly, don't you?" You know, I suppose it's not funny if you do that on stage because people won't. To... Did you just cough? As, yeah. as we were talking last time, Paul, it's probably better to to fart than cough now, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I think the gag goes. Um, yeah, I used to. Uh, uh, I used to cough to disguise as far. Now it's the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, a lot of you in. The, uh, you've done so much TV. Over oh, the season. It frozen You're, again. Have you frozen again? I'll start again to give us an edit point. Yeah, we're back. We're back. Yeah, no, I was going to suggest, Paul, I'm not sure. I mean, because I don't think Paul's internet, I'm not sure, but he's, he's, he's kind of breaking up a little bit. Is your internet okay? There was, If not, maybe we just take the camera off if it helps, if it flows. Um, it's, it, it should be okay. okay. If, if, if it happens again, we'll just go with the audio, yeah? All right, cool. All right, cool. Carry on. Yeah. Um, you're known for so much television and live work over the years. But uh, at the moment, I know that you've been a regular guest for many, many years on Countdown, which for those of international viewers who don't know is a mental agility. Have you got any tips for people who are maybe losing their mind a little bit uh, during lockdown? I, I might be the wrong person to ask in, in this setting. Okay, it's just happened again, Paul. I myself everywhere. It's kind of, uh, yes, I'm very happy with them. What, what I did notice about the um, uh, you know, the first few weeks of the lockdown situation is people were forgetting, literally forgetting what day it was uh, because every day was Groundhog Day. You know, it, it's, um, so I think kind of one little thing, a little tip that I've kind of given a few people is, is about how to keep your memory uh, sharp. Um, so, for example, when I, you know, go to the supermarket or whatever, rather than writing down a list of items, I've got a little mnemonic code uh, to remember them. And it's quite a fun thing to do. So it's basically, I generally do it with about 20 items. I can probably do it up to 30 items. Uh, you can do it with anything at all, people, objects, whatever it may be. Um, and it basically means that for at least 24 hours, usually a lot longer, uh, you can actually pick out any number and you'll know what object you assign to it, and vice versa. Um, so, and all it is is a little kind of rhyming thing. Uh, and it's just, just about sort of mental agility. Um, it, 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 Make up your own rhyme is probably the easiest way, but the way I do it is one is long. It's not a great rhyme, to be honest. One long, two shoe, three tree, four door, five dive, six sticks, seven heaven, eight gate, nine wine, ten hen. Okay? Now, once you've uh, memorised them, you turn them into a picture. So one long, the object you're going to memorise, actually, you just imagine it elongated. So say, for example, you wanted to, uh, you know, buy a, uh, a watermelon uh, was number one. Uh, so you, you rhyme it, you, you rhyme anything that you remember permanently, one long. So you just picture a long watermelon. Sounds silly, but quite, kind of quite cartoony. Two shoe. So whatever the object is, you just imagine it sat in a shoe. Um, you know, so and you, you, same with the rest of them. And surprisingly, it's it's almost instant, uh, instantaneous the way you do it. Uh, but I guarantee if with, with 24 hours, you should be able to remember 20 objects like that. So just come up with your own little and we stop. Rhymes, learn the right. That's the that's the initial bit, you know. Um, and then you just you know, it's, it's actually a really useful thing for uh, when you haven't got your phone with you. Bernardo, can we just do a little tuck in here? I think that that paused for me a few times. Did it pause for you? It, sorry, yeah, it, it did for me too. I think we're probably better off in just taking the video off just in case, okay? So I'll see if we yeah. can get a, a better sound, okay? Sure. Um, yeah, we're probably... Do, do we all have to do that or you're going to just do that? No, it's just, Paul, Paul it, it's nothing personal with you, okay? It is, I, I normally no, ask... No. 
I ask the other pool to turn the camera off because it's it's nicer for me and easier for me. So it's just the internet, all right? So let's just turn them off. I'll do that. Okay. Cool. All right, let's give it a go. Do you mind asking that question again? Because it was very interesting, Paul. And uh, let's, let's, yeah, get that, I think let's get that little technique in. I'm going to turn mine off as well. Can we just do a test to see if uh, you can hear us, Paul? Yes, I can hear and um, your, your sound your, your sound is coming in clear now. So should we, yeah. do you want to ask that question again and share that, that tip again for us, Paul, please? Okay. Yep. So you are, have done so much television over the years, Paul, and but for many years you've also been a regular guest on Countdown, which is the British Mental Agility Quiz. Can you give us any tips of how during this time when people are losing their minds they can stay more mentally agile? Uh, yes, I suppose so. I'm, I'm possibly the wrong person to ask about uh, mental agility and staying sane, bearing in mind what I've been up to the past few weeks, but that's another story. Um, I should also explain as well on Countdown. Uh, Countdown is, is uh, an entirely different programme in Australia, should there be anybody listening from there. They'll be thinking mental agility because Countdown is actually a pop programme um, over there. It's a pop music thing. But yeah, Countdown is all about kind of rearranging random um, uh, letters and numbers to, to come up and create words or uh, reach a total, all that kind of thing. Um, one thing that I, I've, I've kind of refreshed, it was a thing I learned as a kid, actually, was a little uh, mnemonic technique, a little kind of uh, way to keep your memory sharp. So I don't know about you, but by week two, um, I didn't know what day it was, literally what day it was, you know, because every day is sort of groundhog day. So um, I kind of came up with this idea of, of just trying to stay sharp by um, this little, I don't know, it's kind of a, a rhyming thing, really. What you do is you assign a, um, a an object uh, that rhymes with a number. So uh, if if you're going from, say, 1 to 10, you go, well, the one I use, make your own up, but I use 1 long, 2 shoe, 3 tree, 4 door, 5 dive, 6 sticks, 7 heaven, 8 gate, 9 wine, 10 hen. Okay, so once you remember that, uh, all you do is, if you want to remember any objects or places or uh, shopping items, I use this when I go to the supermarket rather than writing things down. I just remember the objects. I can remember, you know, between 20 and 30 objects, and it'll stay in your mind for 24 hours as well. All you do is think, right, one long. Now, you picture the object you want to remember. Say it's a, a, a melon, watermelon, something like that. Um, so you picture uh, one rhymes with long. So you picture a long watermelon, an elongated watermelon as a sort of little cartoon picture. You do the same with the others. So it's two shoe. So say you want to buy a, a, you know, a bunch of bananas. You picture a shoe with a bunch of bananas stuck in it. So the, the, the more kind of clear and more cartoon doing the picture is the better and you just carry on like that with all your um, all the numbers all the objects and i guarantee you that if someone then comes up to you and says what's number 14 you'll think what rhymes with that um picture the object and you'll have whatever you know so it's, it's a good kind of party trick anyway to play but it actually comes in quite useful and since i started um, using this again i found my memory is actually a lot better than it was it's not to say it doesn't go wrong occasionally you know i mean which is basically why i haven't got any toilet roll and about a hundred cans of tuna <laughs> well, actually, but that fits in with the, the brain science, that the brain works in pictures. And so the more cartoony and bizarre you make the pictures, the more likely you are to remember them. That's all right. Yeah, totally. And it's, you know, it, it, the more detail as well, because it's kind of uh, the, the only time you come a cropper, actually, is if uh, one of the objects you want to um, um, remember is one of the objects that you've assigned to a number. <laughs> 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 so uh, yeah, again, so I bought him on his shoes. Yeah, exactly. So, but uh, the, the way I kind of get around that is by picturing whatever the object is you want to remember, kind of on top of or inside of the other one. So that if you picture it the other way around, you know which is which, basically. Does that make sense? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it makes absolute sense. Absolute sense. Yeah, no, and I think it's a brilliant technique. I love it. Yeah, it's just a simple little thing, you know, it's, it's, um, but uh, as I say, it's a thing that a lot of people are suffering with, you know, I've kind of uh, had friends who go, yeah, oh God, it doesn't feel like a weekend, you go, no, because it's because it isn't, it's Wednesday. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, one of the things, obviously, when we came up with the idea of the isolation to inspiration, we were talking about obviously bringing a little bit of humour 
into this. What, what have you found funny or, or entertaining? Uh, and there's been a lot. Or, you know, there's all these gifts we've been talking about, you know, circulating on WhatsApp with people wearing, I don't know, like these bottles of water over their heads or, you know, walking around like Darth Vader. I've seen chickens, uh, you know, dressed in chicken uniforms. Well, what, what has been entertaining for you? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've even kind of, you know, I even had a dress-up day myself, uh, you know, bearing in mind that I live on my own. Um, you know, actually thinking about it, that's not that, uh, not that unusual for me. But uh, it's, quite, <laughs> it's quite nice that, um, you know, people are, are using the time uh, frivolously, I think, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people trying to persuade you to kind of, you know, learn an instrument, learn a language, or take up some sort of crafting or artwork or the rest of it, which is all great. Um, but actually, I think, you know, in, in stressful times, you just need to let yourself be silly occasionally and a bit daft, you know, and uh, uh, it, it's good to have a little bit of uh, lateral thinking humor-wise. You know, I mean, uh, I've noticed the past couple of days the uh, the number of memes coming up and gifts, as you say, um, kind of instantly about kind of political issues, things in the news and all the rest of it. And uh, it's, it's because people have got the time now and, you know, they're at home and they're probably a lot more computer literate as well uh, because they've been using, uh, you know, online sources a lot more. Uh, people are actually being, as, as a, you know, a response to, uh, to the stress, people are becoming, you know, spot spontaneously creative you know it's not as though they're setting out to uh, to learn a new art or craft or whatever but they are doing it anyway by default really and it's it's just you know um i've, I've also been you know comedy wise i've been looking at a load of uh, a lot of old stuff you know it kind of it, it feels a little bit like reminding yourself of the good old days it, you know a bit uh, nostalgic um but why not what better time to do it you know um watch a few uh, comedians talking about being in the pub do you remember that <laughs> No. God, it was about a thing once upon a time. <laughs> well, we, we've started doing it on a, a Sunday evening. I've got a group of friends who's, uh, we usually meet up on a Sunday evening in the pub, the Battle of Trafalgar in, in Brighton. And uh, it's basically a grumpy old git club, basically. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's just half a dozen old geezers who sit around and moan about stuff. Uh, and so we started doing it online now on a Sunday. Um, the, the, the problem is that you kind of don't realise, um, you know, on, on something like Zoom where it kind of cuts to whoever's talking, basically, um, then, you know, you've got the problem that the, uh, the pub loudmouth suddenly realised that he's it. You know, I had, I had one of my friends the other day sort of saying, why is it that, you know, um, um, this keeps happening? He said, because you're the person in the pub who actually talks over everybody and you're doing it now, you know? <laughs> And the good thing is you can record it, so there's evidence. Yes, that's, yeah, that's a good and a bad thing, I reckon, yeah. So do you think people are going to actually sort of like be, become more self-aware based on working over Zoom or Teams and everything when they have to actually watch themselves doing this stuff? It is said that we live in a world our questions create, and it's true. Those that have succeeded in life, those that stand out, those that have made a difference, those that are inventing, those that are exploring, pushing the boundaries of reality are based on those that have asked themselves empowering questions. In my new book, The Question, Find Your True Purpose, I help you find your true purpose, find your legacy. For more information, go to www.thequestion.co. Um, it's a good point, actually. I think um, in terms of, you know, uh, people who uh, get up and speak in public and things like that, it's it's slightly different because it's only your, your head, really, isn't it? You know, so you, because you're kind of grounded at a desk or table or whatever it might be, um, you're not really using much body language, which is an important part of, of kind of communi communicating things when you're performing live, as you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's I think people are more aware of their face and possibly less aware of their legs. You know, I mean, I'm not wearing any pants now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's an image we don't want. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, no, but actually, I think it's an, a, an interesting uh, thing that, that, that people are having to act as if they were newscasters. You know, yes. you, you, you're only seeing the top of their body. So do you think you're getting less over um, to people because you are limited. So therefore you're having to use your face more. How have you found, you know, on Zooms, are you um, more animated with your face? And would you encourage people who are listening to, to come to, to those kind of um, realise more about their, what their face can do? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's a very odd one for me because you know, doing doing magic on stage, I'm you know, I'm, because I'm standing up, you've got the, the the body language of your whole body, but also I'm using my hands a lot and moving around. So when I'm not doing a trick or holding a prop, I'm kind of you know using them to gesture or whatever it is. And generally, when you sat doing this kind of thing in front of a laptop, your elbows are on the table, you know. So so yes, and also obviously when you normally have a conversation with people one to one, you don't see your own face, you know, unless you talk to yourself in a mirror and it's, it's a, an interesting one because I think a lot of people will realise that what they thought was their facial expression isn't actually the face they're pulling while they're talking so I think that will uh, you know gradually adapt and I think for most people that's probably changed quite a lot over the past couple of months. So do you think Covid will be the death of resting bitch face? <laughs> Uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, it's certainly the death of live entertainment for the time being. But it's um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's I, I think the people that are already self conscious to some extent will change their the way they uh, you know present for want of a better phrase. Um, but I think the ones who are not self conscious to start with will probably not not give a damn. They're the same people on social media who goes take me as you find me. You know. So um, so yeah, basically people who are. I'm not that self-confident, might actually adapt, whereas everybody who's already um, confident won't give a damn, you know? So, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting for a large a large part of the population, I think. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, uh, we were talking about, obviously, kind of like, you know, the, the, the whole idea of, of getting back out there and and and, and, and engaging and, and connecting. I mean... I don't know. I've, I've got mixed kind of feelings of, of, of the whole thing of, of, you know, what I do believe obviously that, you know, eventually it would all come back to normal within, within reason and, and it will take time. But, but what was your thoughts, Paul, I mean, as far as, you know, kind of an entertainer and being in open spaces, you know, I, I promote big events. So, you know, kind of I've been used to, and, and Paul's always been speaking at big events. So well, what's your thoughts kind of in the short term and in the long term? Do, do you think there's going to be a, a difference in, in, in the way we interact or, or, or not? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I read an interesting thing the other day on a, this, uh, a lot of comedians chatting online and uh, someone said, you know, when the comedy clubs reopen, because it's a small environment and you know, no matter how they do it, even with kind of social distancing or whatever, it's still, there's still going to be, you know, certainly initially uh, a slight risk element for anybody that's going to go and sit in the audience there. Um, and he said, so I reckon those first gigs will be absolutely fantastic because the audience has actually got uh, an investment, you know, from a, from a, a kind of personal risk point of view. Uh, and so it could actually change the atmosphere of live gigs. And so and I think, you know, the, the uh, my gut feeling uh, is, is probably that initially people are, are scared to go out, but when they do, I think they'll really go for it. And I think we'll actually see uh, bigger reactions from audiences to, to performers of all kinds, you know. Uh, and I also, I think from the performer's point of view as well, uh, it's, it's going to be so long since they worked in front of a live audience other than, you know, online, uh, that they're really going to go for it and give it their all. So I, I think in a weird sort of way, we're in for some, some great gigs of all kinds. Mm. Yeah. So people don't know what they've got till it's gone. So, you know, there's, there's going to be a euphoria around it, really. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, you know, the people that are going to be there are the ones that really want to be there, you know. Um, yeah. so. I, I was actually going to point that out. That I think that's going to be the case, isn't it? I think the people that want to be there will want to be there. And, and I think that's the that's the bottom line. Listen, if, if you're quite happy at home, we'll stay at home, you know, just yeah. carry on being miserable, but don't make everyone else's life miserable, you know? Yeah, well, there's always been a, a kind of psychology amongst, you know, um, everything from club promoters um, to, to performers themselves that the, you know, there's this perceived value. So in other words, if someone's paid a lot of money, uh, you know, to crash out for a ticket, they'll make sure they enjoy the show. Um, you know, I've, I've always said, if you, you know, if you could do a little comedy club above a pub or whatever, and people go, free admission, that'll get them in. And you go, yeah, but they won't be a good audience because they it's the perceived value of the show. They've paid nothing for it, so they think it's worth nothing. Whereas even if you charged a pound to get in, there's an investment of some sort. So they're going to make sure they have a better time than if they haven't paid anything at all, you know. And I think it's a, a parallel with that. So if it is that thing of, you know, it's a lot of effort to get there, you've got to go through a lot of, you know, queuing to, you know, longer queues to get in, uh, you know, you're going to be spaced out. It's, it's going to be, you know, a weird atmosphere in some respects. But once that show actually starts, you're really going to make the most of it. I think you're right. I think it's, uh, I think, 
that there there is a desperation now for for entertainment and also social interaction. Um, I was going to take you in the, the magic direction as well because. We've seen, and we won't name names, but we can if you want, we've seen politicians doing certain aspects of magic, i.e. misdirection. Do yes. you look at those politicians and, 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 as a magician, spot what they're doing immediately? Yeah, pretty much, I have to say. Um, it, it, it's... It's absolutely baffling to me, particularly in recent times, that, you know, I, I think I, I tell lies for a living. That's that's basically what a magician does. You, you're, you're an honest liar, you know. Um, you're deceitful, but you're not using it for, you know, nefarious purposes, usually. Um, I leave that to the psychics and the mediums. But the, um, the interesting thing is watching, you know, uh, recent events, you just go, how obvious is this? And, and so you can make a little prediction, you know, this has happened, so, you know, the next stage will be this, and meanwhile, that kind of slips through underneath and sure enough you know it, it happens it's just it's, it's astonishing to me how i don't know whether people don't want to see it or they just don't see it i mean it's, it's kind of some of the uh the obfuscation is just so really really obvious and i, I don't think that's just because i'm a magician but i think it certainly helps having those you know uh, those techniques to recognize it by but uh yeah just quite quite astonishing really can we give people uh, something to counter that with? How do how do they recognise when they are being misdirected? Um, it's an interesting thing because I've, I've seen you know most of the times when these things happen, um, it's not just you know people like me that see it a mile off. It's actually predicted by various people in the media, on social media, wherever. But it's kind of fingers in the ears situation. It's as though people don't want to hear it, you know. And they can come out with the most outlandish excuse for some some action, um, and people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I knew it was for that reason, you know, because that's what they wanted it to be. Because they got they're already invested in what they already believe in, and they don't want that changing. That's one of the most embarrassing things for people from a personal perspective is something that they've invested in emotionally um, something they really believe in it can be glaringly obvious that that thing is you know collapsed around them or was never true to start with but they'll just refuse point blank to believe it you know as uh, again back to you know being a, a, a sort of skeptic with regards to psychics and the paranormal in general um, i've seen it time and time again where you can actually just you know predict what the medium is going to say about someone in a audience and sure enough they say it but they think that they're psychic not you you know you've explained how they've done it but they still will believe that this person uh, got the information by you know uh, paranormal means rather than an earpiece or you know reading yesterday's newspaper or someone feeding the information one way or another uh, and it's because they're so desperate to hear a, a message from a dead loved one whatever it may be uh, that they will believe any old tosh and you, you can present them with the facts and you know t uh, explain the techniques till you're blue in the face but they won't listen because they don't want to basically well i was going to say that I, I i can't believe any politicians would have done that uh i mean <laughs> boris wouldn't have done that i mean he did disappear for a couple of weeks uh but that wasn't a trick was it uh <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what if I, if I was any good as a magician he'd have disappeared long ago <laughs> yeah. top trumps <laughs> well, have you heard this is going to be current today I was reading that Trump is going to sue Twitter um, how is he going to communicate I mean he can't do that he said he's going to shut them down because they just like they, they were kind of monitoring one of his, his tweets because it looks like it might be fake news which is so so hysterical but how is he going to communicate if they shut his Twitter account down well he's basically he's, his whole career is built on Twitter isn't it it's kind of you know that's how he got there in the first place that's it <laughs> I'll tell you, a, a, a kind of quite terrifying thing. When I was in the States, um, I was in Las Vegas about, when was it? November 2018, I think. And um, I was, you know, bearing in mind, I've got a British phone uh, on me. And I was driving along with my mate, who's got his American phone there. And uh, they, both, they, they, they both made this really loud noise both phones simultaneously that I'd never heard before it was louder than anything I'd heard on my phone and it was a different you know, not in a ringtone it was like a, a, a kind of klaxon sort of noise 
um, and it was an emergency test thing. It was basically, uh, apparently, Trump t- trying out a new means of communication. It was supposedly for use during an emergency, so, you know, incoming nuclear warheads or whatever it was. But it basically, in real terms, meant that he could contact every phone in the country directly, every person, um, with whatever message he wanted, you know? So uh, look f- forward to that in the run-up to the next elections. <laughs> Gosh, that, that is scary and everything. Um, well, talking about sort of people um, of power and people you've worked with uh, uh, over the years, who has impressed you the most? And you've worked with extraordinary people. Who's impressed you and why? Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, kind of. Usually, you forget asked things like that. Is who's the most famous person you work with, or whatever? But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of. Um, I work with a few sort of you know personal heroes, and so I was a kind of bit taken aback by just from that fact that I kind of you know not just met them and worked with them, um, but glad to say that I wasn't disappointed in many cases either. You know, when you see them behind the scenes as well as on stage, because so I think a lot of performers have favourite performers either because of their, you know, actual technique, their actual skills, because they're in the same business, or because they've met them backstage and they're a nice person or helpful or or whatever else. So when someone's the kind of complete works, that's when it's, you know, really impressive to you. Uh, One that springs to mind is is Bob Monkhouse, um, who obviously I'd grown up watching on TV on, you know, lots of uh, game shows and uh, uh, various, you know, comedy films and all the rest of it and uh, I, I emceed a show with him uh, in Eastbourne south coast of England and it was a big theatre uh, and I was, I, you know, I was kind of hosting the show and he arrived um, mid-afternoon you know he, he wasn't going to be on until closing the bill at about sort of 9.30 in the evening but he arrived mid-afternoon and sat in the stalls and watched the rehearsals for the show um, and then the show itself he sat up in the circle and watched the first half um, from up there um, and he did have this um, um, it was kind of a thing of legend. He had this um, suitcase with him carried by his, his chauffeur who had a proper, proper peak cap and all that kind of thing. But he had a suitcase which was a file index of gags. So he could look up any subject. You know, this is obviously before the days of, uh, of the personal computers and things. Um, and it was, yeah, basically a, 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 you know, a traveling filing cabinet of gags so that he could tailor it, which he didn't need to do, you know, because he could have just trotted out pretty much the same material wherever he was. Um, and um, when I asked him how he wanted to be introduced, he gave me a great bit of advice that I've used at every corporate event since when, you know, when the MD, the CEO of the company um, asks you how you want to be introduced. Uh, and they usually get it wrong by starting off with your name. You know, so they'll go, um, um, we've got Paul Zenon coming on now. Uh, he's the cabaret. And you can see it dawn in their face that they've got nowhere to go now to bring you on because they've already said your name. So, uh, so I give him this bit of advice that Bob Munkhouse gave me, which was um, say any three things in ascending the order of interta- intonation and then put my name at the end. <laughs> and it's great advice, you know. Bob Monkhouse. And it's, uh, yeah, just very simple, but, but great advice, you know. So, uh, he, yeah, he was, uh, he was probably, you know, one of the top of the list you know classic great comedian nice guy and a real pro as well you know and uh, he, I changed him after the show it was bearing in mind at that point in time lots of the old school comedians were either not interested or, or having a go at what they called alternative comedians in those days you know the, the young upstarts you know so people like Jimmy Tarbuck and whatever would you say you know uh, there's no good comedian under the age of 30 and then when he got to 50 there was no good comedian under the age of 40 and so it went on <laughs> Bob Monkhouse uh, sat there, had a long conversation with him, talking about all the young up and comings. You know, every, everything from the the young ones on TV to um, uh, you know Alexis Sale and uh, um, at that point who was the oh, Jerry Sadowitz, people like that. So all these people, I was astounded that he even knew their names, but he knew he knew their act. You know, um, well so that's it, fascinating because actually I did a, a gig with him at the Birmingham Hippodrome, which is uh, bought listeners where Paul and I first met um, with um, Jasper Carrot yeah, in uh, Jasper Carrot um, uh, Lenny Henry um, Rowan Atkinson it was literally a who's who of comedy and we were on the bill and the most yeah. astonishing thing and this is shows uh, your point is that Bob Monkhouse who was an enormous star 
came up to us, my band Morris Moran and the Majors, and said, it's so lovely to meet you. I really like the thing you do with that. And that song's really great. And this, and we were staggered that he'd even heard of us. But he was so actually sort of compelled to actually talk to you about your act and everything. Uh, it just impressed me forever. That, and yeah. those kind of people... Um, there's a piece of advice that everybody needs to know. If you're interested in other people, they will love you for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's all else. I mean, you look at his, his pedigree as well. You know, I mean, the, uh, there's that famous case where a comedian called, was it Lee, um, Lee Hurst, who was going yeah. for, big for a while doing the, um, uh, the sports uh, comedy program, I forget what it was called. Uh, they think it's all over. That's the one. Yeah. And he was on a panel show with Bob Monkhouse, and Bob Monkhouse did uh, a, a particular gag. Uh, it, it may have even been that the old line about, you know, I've, I've got a stepladder, I didn't get on with my real ladder or whatever it was. It was one of those kind of, <laughs> kind of pun things. And uh, Lee Hurst, after the recording, said to Bob Monkhouse, a bit naughty that, using Harry Hill's gag. And Bob Monkhouse didn't really say anything. He just went, oh, okay, went, went away. And the following week, they came in to record, and Bob Monkhouse just handed in this VHS tape. Uh, and it was a recording of Bob Monkhouse doing that gag in 1958, I think it was, <laughs> <laughs> on some TV programme, you know. But he didn't, you know, he, he did rub it in his face, but he, he wasn't nasty about it. He just went, well, there's your, you know, there's your evidence, where, rather than uh, getting, you know, upstarts. Yeah, those, VHS, those VHS tapes were very big. I hope he didn't put it somewhere else, because, I mean, that would have <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah. Oh, I'll tell you another one as well, another classic uh, comedian who I, I was very fortunate to, well, I've worked with him a few times actually over a long period, but uh, I was fortunate to do one of his last ever shows and that was Ken Dodd. And um, it was there's, there's a, in, the, in Blackpool, which is a, uh, a seaside resort for no apparent reason other than it's by the sea, um, in the northwest of England. And it's kind of it's the British home of show business, really. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a variety anyway of light entertainment. And every year they have the biggest magicians conference in the world. And it is in February. The, the rest of the town is closed down, but the Winter Gardens and the, the big Opera House Theatre, they have this convention, 4,000 attendees. Um, and the, the local magicians club put it on. And Ken Dodd was the, the honorary life president uh, of this thing. So he used to come on and they'd say, Ken, this year on, on the gala show, can you just really keep it tight? Just honestly, five minutes will be fine because he always did it. Uh, uh, he'd never do less than 45 minutes, you know, and this is part of a, a big show and all that because he's notorious for doing doing long, long shows. You know, I mean, even when he was in his 80s, um, he was doing five and a half hour shows for which he was on the stage for four and a half hours of that. He basically had two 20 minute supports, a 20 minute interval, but he was on stage for four and a half hours solo. It's quite incredible, you know. Um, but anyway, he was hosting just, he suddenly died, uh, I think it was a year before last, or last year, whichever. Um, and one of the last shows he did uh, in one of his favourite theatres, the Blackpool Opera House, was the Magician's Convention. And as luck would have it, um, he, um, I won an award that year from, from the Magician's thing. I was hosting the gala show. And so they, they only told me just before the show, he said, after the interval, Ken will come on, he'll present the five awards, and you'll be the last one of those. Then you take him off and, and get on with the show, uh, with the second half. And so that's fine. So he, um, the, the stage manager and, uh, and, uh, and uh, one of the crew carried this table on in, in the interval with the five awards on it. They introduced an offstage announcement, Ken Dodd came on, he's got his trademark tickling sticks, you know, these, these feather dusters, basically, um, that he waves around. Uh, and then he, he chucks them on the floor and starts his act. And so he, he went on and on and on. And his partner, uh, who became his wife just before he died, she, uh, before he died, the, uh, she was stood behind the backdrop. So by the time he'd done about 25 minutes, half an hour, she's stamping her foot going, Ken, come on, Ken, Ken, come on, and try to get him to, to get the awards. So eventually, uh, one of the, the, uh, the stage manager walks on, picks up one of the awards and, uh, on stage and thrusts it into his hands. He went, okay, he goes, all right. So then he, he starts to present a couple of awards, goes back into his act. So the stage manager walks back on again, picks up this last award, uh, which is the, the one I'm getting, puts it in his ha hands and, and carries the table off. So Kendall then puts this award down on the, on the stage and carried on again. So it's... 
He's on stage now for about 40 odd minutes. And eventually the, uh, the stage manager just walks back on, picks it up off the stage. I went, Ken, present the award. He went, it's all right. I, you know, I'm not that old. I can bend over, you know. And so eventually he comes out and he introduces me and I go out and I get me a award. It's all very nice. We have a bit of a laugh. And uh, he said, uh, he sort of goes, can you sing, young man? I went, no, I really, I really cannot sing. You know, it's one of the most embarrassing things, you know, for, for me to be asked to do or whatever. And I'm in front of 5,000 peers, 4,000 peers in, in the audience. And uh, he said, well, I'm sure the audience will help you out. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Happiness, happiness. It starts into this. <laughs> this tune so I'm trying to hold the microphone as far away from my mouth as I can and get away and so it's, it's all been quite embarrassing so I go ladies and gentlemen the legend uh, Sir Ken Dodd and just as he walks past me he goes can you pick me tickling sticks up I can't bend over <laughs> 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 so that, and that, and that, as I said, that was one of his, his last gigs. I mean, what an absolute legend! Uh, you know, it was only several months later that he, uh, he sadly uh, he sadly passed away. Uh, but the, the buzz of, of being given—he was actually called the Ken Dodd Award as well. That I got. So the, the fact that I was the last recipient from him himself, and on that stage because you know Blackpool's sort of my hometown, um, in front of all the magicians, and, and you, you know that 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 kind of made my made my year actually. That. Paul Barros is the Pitch Doctor, Professor of Humorology and Business Activator. If you would be interested in booking him to speak, train your teams, or executive coach you, you can reach him by going to www.paulbarros.com now. Well, Bernardo and I talk a lot about um, charisma and what it is I and, and how you... Time. What, what's, what's, what we're what <laughs> interested in that? You ask him where to get some? I guess. Well, yeah. Can you nip down the shops and get us both a bucket? <laughs> yeah. Um, but but seriously, you know, um, one of the things about comedians and actors and things that the people always talk about is their charisma. For our listeners, what what would you advise? How do you how do you become more charismatic? You know what? I've, I've genuinely no idea on that. It's that it's that whole thing with comedians that go, he's got funny bones or whatever. And it's something you can't quantify. And I don't think it's something that you can learn other than by just doing stage time, just spending as long on stage, you know, in every situation as you can so that you're actually um, confident. You know, because I think even if your character is is sort of nervous, twitchy, you know, sort of Lee Evans type character, you can only actually do that if you've got the confidence to do it bizarrely. So it, it sounds almost counterintuitive, but I think it's a, it's a secret confidence. It's not confidence that you actually know about yourself, but it's just that you've you've kind of walked through something so many times in so many environments, so many different situations, so many different audiences um, that you've you've got time uh, well it's basically just your brain space is actively thinking about just the performance not being nervous not you know it, it shutting out things that you shouldn't need to think about in that situation so that you're thinking just about the performance itself and i think that's really important is it is it linked somehow is 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 charisma uh, you know being fun entertaining is it also linked somehow i i, I suppose is it with personality because I think a lot of the times, you know, well, as we say, you know, some people are just not funny, you know, that they, they try and say jokes, so please don't, you know, so, but is it, is it linked somehow with personality people that have that, I don't know, they don't necessarily have to be outgoing, but they have something about them? Yeah, I mean, I think what's what's interesting is there are some people that kind of decide they want to be funny. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to mention uh, names of people that I know, but there are, there are some people that just go, I want to be a comedian, and they will learn it um, kind of forensically, if you will. Um, and they, they do manage it because they, they treat it like a science, you know, so it's all about technique. Uh, whether they've then got charisma just through, um, you know, the same route of, of, of stage time and, and doing it over and over, I'm not sure. But I, I tend to think that the people who end up as, you know, any sort of performer who has charisma, they would have had it anyway, regardless of whether or not they're a performer to a large extent. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so uh, intangible, you know, it's, it's indefinable in some, some respects. But I think it's not something that you can learn. Uh, you can only, you know, it, you can only hope it rubs off on you by attrition, basically. 
Yeah. Do you think that sort of uh, comedy can be taught? Because um, we've had this conversation, both of us, with um, people like Paul Merton and all comedians talk about it, that you either hear it's funny or it's not. So you, I was interested, do you think that some people have gone, I want that, and scientifically go through the process? Um, do you not have to have an, a semblance of hearing funny? Um, yes, I think I think you do have to have something. I mean, obviously there are lots of different elements of, of doing comedy that can be taught. You know, everything from microphone technique to how you walk on to how long you pause before you do your first line, or the more importantly, the structure of the of the act itself. You know, um, but I think there's probably a, a minority of people that just can't be taught enough to be able to do it in any form. Uh, the ones that become successful on it. Uh, at it uh, are either you know you're born naturals if there is such a thing um, or the ones that you know already had some element of, of, of understanding of comedy or, or you know be able to spot the gag or time a gag or whatever um, but they've you know improved on that by training or or mainly study um, but I say I, I think you know my gut feeling is that that you just can't beat getting out there and doing it you know when I, I've, I've been asked a lot of times by you know young magicians people just getting into the game what's the best way of you know, what sort of shows should I do when you just say well you know do everything do you know go and do a show at the local hospital do the Sally Army fundraiser do the you know what well, just 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 do it and keep doing it uh, in different situations you know uh, and I think that's I've, I've kind of always looked at myself as being a, a sort of survivor show business wise because you adapt to whatever the situation is I mean this you know the whole kind of COVID thing now uh, is forcing people to to uh, adapt and I'm sure, you know, magic, comedy, all the rest of it will take a different slant from now on because of that. You know, I think it's, you know, that awful phrase, the new normal, but I think we are in for uh, a period where things will be radically different for quite a long time. Um, so it's, it's just, yeah, it's about adaptability and you can't do that without studying what's gone before you, you know, so we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, basically. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, I think that's great advice. And um, I wanted to ask you, because obviously you've been quite a prolific writer as well. You, you've published quite a few books. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you about that and, you know, how, you know, if there's anything that you can share in order to kind of, you know, get these books out. And some people might have taken this down, this down time. Now, I, one of the books that obviously I was looking at yours and things have been tough for me. So I want you to share with us one, uh, one way that uh, I, we can make a tenner uh, because you, you shared a hundred ways. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'd love you to share one of those. And first of all, yeah, how have you become so prolific in kind of writing books? Uh, and then, you know, if there's any techniques you can share with us and, and share, please, something, because there's a lot of people that could probably buy your book now and uh, try and find some ways of making some money. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I just, just steal it, basically. It's, it's one way of saving a tenner. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I did... You know, uh, initially I didn't want to do uh, an out-and-out -out magic book, which sounds a bit odd, but I thought, you know, that's something I want to do slightly later. So the first one was called 100 Ways to Win a Tenor, uh, because at that point I was concentrating on tricks and, and scams and all that. I've always been interested in kind of films about cons and, and heists and that sort of thing. So I thought, I'll actually sort of combine the two, uh, the two and do a, a thing. But it's basically bar bets is what we're looking at. So it's ways to kind of get, uh, you know, uh, wind your mate up. You know, it doesn't have to be for money. It's just, you know, but yeah, if you lose the bet, you do this forfeit or whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to, with not having the visual medium here because most of them rely on, you know, tricks with um, drinking glasses or bottles or, you know, uh, cash or whatever it might be. Um, but a, a lot of it is sort of wordplay as well. So, for example, you might say uh, to someone, well, um, right, you sit on that chair and I, I bet... I can pick you and the chair up using one hand and hold you up in the air for 10 seconds, right? If I'm wrong, you owe me a tenner, okay? So you go, right, so they sit on the chair and you grab hold of the leg and go, no, actually, I am wrong. You owe me a tenner. <laughs> by the time they're, look, they're looking at the proposition to start with, they're not actually listening to what you're saying by that point, which was, if I'm wrong, you owe me a tenner. 
So it's little, that's, that's a really basic example of that sort of thing, you know. Uh, the the follow-up um, book I did was called, uh, it was initially called Dirty Tricks. I mean, a few have been kind of re-released under different titles. And that was basically kind of revenge-style practical jokes because that was another little sort of phase I had. I did a, a TV show called uh, Paul Zenon's Revenge Squad, which was basically taking um, targets of uh, professions that the general public don't really like the first example, obviously, being like traffic wardens, parking attendants, uh, and then going out hidden camera wise and winding them up. So I kind of did a book to sort of tie in with that, and so it was just ways ways to get your own back, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, then the third one we did was uh, was street magic, um, and obviously on the back of the the Channel Four and the ITV uh, street magic programs that I did, uh, and that was what I did there was. It was a tricky one because the book was aimed at the public uh, and magicians do tend to, you know, the magic circle get a little bit uppity about you writing, you know, giving away secrets. So what I did, I thought, well, I'll treat it seriously and I'll try and write the book that I would have liked to have received, uh, received as a present when I was a teenager, you know, when I was just starting out learning magic. And so it starts off with kind of quite easy self-working tricks and then builds up through slight hand stuff to some quite difficult, you know, sort of professional level stuff at the end. Uh, and that was really nicely received. That was a really hard one to, uh, to write as well because the convention is to write magic books for uh, right-handed people and I'm left-handed. So when we did all the descriptions for it and, and all the, uh, the photographs for it, I actually almost had to relearn everything because we had the photographs were taken. You know, somebody said, well, why don't you just flip the photos? But it doesn't work with playing cards or, you know, the pictures on coins because they're obviously the wrong, then the wrong way around, you know. So we spent a long time doing that, but was pretty pleased with the end result. They, I mean, the process of writing a book, I don't, I really don't enjoy it. And it's the same with a, even with a short article for a magazine, whatever it may be. Uh, I'm fine once I get going, but it's that classic thing of, of, you know, I'll have the idea, I know the shape of it, the whole thing, but it's actually just getting that first few pages down, you know. So once you can force yourself to do that, I think for most people it gets a lot easier after that. But I don't actually enjoy the writing process. I, I wouldn't pretend to be some kind of... Uh, tortured author or whatever you know i'm not talking about writing fiction stuff but uh it's yeah it's it's, it's hard work it's hard graft and i think well, that's a lot of our, sorry a lot on. of our listeners are going to be um you know everybody thinks that they've got a book inside them and actually i think that that's that's quite hopeful for people that even somebody like you who's written a lot of books and well, all of us have written books it's not an easy process I, I was going to say I, I, I've now got a tip which I give to um, people for writing books is I, you know, it's literally get the words down on paper. And now with technology, there's so many ways. I'm sitting here with my iPhone in front of me. I can flick on my iPhone and record the ideas and then automatically get it transcribed. So yeah. that is writing. And that's what I think people need to know is it's just a process of getting stuff down on paper. And when you said, OK, you know, it's once I start and I get it down on paper, it is about the doing rather than the talking about. What do you think of that? Well, I, yeah. I was just going to comment on that, Paul. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say that, it, it, you know, it's not recording when you're coming from the pub at three in the morning. You know, that might not be very appropriate. But, um, yeah. That's, well, I that's exactly how I do it for me. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I usually, um, my, I'm very nocturnal. And so I kind of, um, I don't get much work done during the day usually uh, anyway. But in, in the, old, the old days of pubs, um, I go literally go to the pub for the last hour and then I come back and start work. And that, that's my kind of creative time is, is after midnight, basically. Probably, you know, I, I get most of my stuff done in terms of, of being created between about midnight and 3.34 a.m. Uh, most of the time. And, and the thing is, when I've had to do emails and things like that, where you know, it's an important email, it's got to be there for the next morning, all the rest of it, I'm so self-conscious about writing it while drunk that I actually genuinely do a, a, a better job because I kind of go over it and go over it to make sure I haven't made myself look stupid. Uh, whereas, whereas if I did it the first thing in the morning, it'd be full of mistakes because I'm not awake by that point, you know. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm usually pleasantly surprised when I get up the next day and panic till I read it back, you know. 
Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. When I was talking about this the other day, when uh, I, 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 the first things I wrote really were for um, Ideas for Kids TV, and that was probably around about 1990-ish there onwards. And at that point, I couldn't type. Um, and the, yeah, and I think I got my first computer, which was a glorified word processor, in about 1992, I think, something like that. Before that, what I used to do was write freehand on lined paper, and then you'd take it to a local secretarial place. Do you remember them? Where mm-hmm. they would, for whatever it was, two pounds a page of, of A4 or whatever, would type it up for you. And inevitably, I'm a manual typewriter. And then inevitably, they make mistakes. So you'd have to go through it and point them out. And they go and do it, you know, they go back and do it again. And so you think of the process is so much easier from that point of view now. Uh, the fact that you can, you know, uh, as you say, you know, do uh, the voice. Um, uh, recognition thing, or you know, just just typing on a laptop or on your phone or whatever. So it's taken that element of it being hard work away. Uh, but I still think that it, it's that daunting thing. I think I, what the, the lockdown has been very hard for is the motivation to do something by a certain point. If you're anything like me, you need deadlines for things. And so the fact that this is, you know, it was at one stage pretty much open ended still is to a large extent, you think, well, I don't actually need to do that now, do I? I can do it whenever. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm a, a, a real procrastinator for it from that point of view. When I do work, I think I work hard, but just getting going on, on things is, is difficult. So I think, you know, if, if anybody's got any tips on 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 the motivation of actually you know, setting yourself, you know, the time limit for things, then that's, that's, I... that's more than welcome this end. Funnily, funnily enough, actually, I, I I worked that out a few years ago. Is I like, if, for instance, my publisher. I'll ring up my publisher and say I'll have that with you by Friday, mm-hmm. and then I put the phone down and I go, "Why did I say that?" Yeah. I've just, but actually, I like putting myself under pressure. Because sure. otherwise, I procrastinate as well, like everybody yeah. does, I think. And so if you tell other people, I think that's the tip, is I'll have it with you by a certain time, then yeah. you're kind of forced into that corner. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and I, I think actually the thing just occurred to me as well, that when I think the, uh, the things that I've done over the past, well, certainly past kind of decade or so uh, work-wise, that I've been, I've been most out of my comfort zone, the most difficult things to do, you know, the things that I didn't need to do are the things that I'm most proud of or the things that I'm most glad that I did. You know, there's a, a prime example. I did a, a, a kind of one-man play thing, which I think you saw up in Edinburgh, didn't you? Uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Mixed rings. Licking rings. Um, yeah, uh, which was a, it was a weird thing. I said, I wanted to do a play, uh, just just as a little challenge to myself. I thought I'd do a one-man play. Uh, and I thought, you know, I've, I've always been fascinated with Houdini. It's a name that the general public kind of know about. So I started writing this thing um, from the point of view of Houdini's right-hand man, who was a, uh, a guy called Jim Collins. Uh, and my uh, original family name is Collins. Yeah, who'd have thought? Is that a stage name? Huh? Uh, <laughs> And uh, I was going to call myself Butch Stardust, but I thought that's just a bit too camp. Um, <laughs> but it, um, I started writing this thing, and it was it was this guy kind of looking back on the life of Houdini just after Houdini died, um, and he had to go back to the theatre to pack up the, the boss's props one last time, all this kind of thing. And I started writing it, and it was kind of gradually getting there. And then a thing happened in my personal life where a guy who was my mentor, a guy called Bill Thompson, who ran a, a magic shop called The House of Secrets in Blackpool. I used, used to work there as a teenager, and he was kind of a, a lifelong friend. But he became ill, and I ended up looking after him and all the rest of it. And he, without giving the whole kind of plot of the thing, should anybody ever see it, um, I kind of realised, uh, t- t- together with my ex-partner, actually, she pointed it out, that the story was running in parallel to what I was writing. Uh, what, it was kind of happening in real life. And then it, there came a point she said... She, should should write that into it, you know, make make it a kind of dual story, uh, and in the end, I, uh, you know, it ended up more about that. It was about growing up in Blackpool. It was kind of a bit uh, autobiogra- autobiographical and all the rest of it. It ended up a quite a complex thing, but it was actually really difficult to perform. It was difficult to write. It was something I'd never done before. That kind of genre. Uh, it was really hard to perform because it used to get me emotionally every time I did it. I, I, I performed it probably about sixty times, and there's a point in it where I just get choked up every time. And it's just quite bizarre. Uh, it's, it's like a cathartic thing. So in the end, 
I, there's no reason for me doing this play in the first place, apart from as a bit of a challenge to myself, a kind of vanity project. Uh, but in the end, it's the thing that I'm most glad I did. Uh, I've never made any money out of it either. I mean, that's the other thing. It wasn't a financial thing. But um, it, it's, it's hard to, it was hard to write. It's hard to perform. Um, and it wasn't rewarding uh, economically. Uh, however, it's the thing that I'm most glad about. And so I think if you can, uh, you know, use that as an idea of, of uh, there might be something that you've always wanted to do, um, but, you know, it's too hard or what's the point or all the rest of it. Um, it's probably worth knowing that a, a lot of people feel that way about a, a lot of works that they end up be, being quite proud of, actually. Well, Paul, listen, I want to thank you so much. Um, it, the time just flew very quickly there. Um, thank you so much. Sure. It's, been, it's, been, it's been really, uh, really fun, very entertaining, um, very versatile. Congratulations on all your great work and all the amazing things you've done and achieved. I'll thank you. Uh, well, it, it just feel like a bit like a requiem, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, congratulations. Well done. Paul, uh, other Paul, uh, anything else to add? Well, no, just thank you, Paul, because uh, you've always been uh, an inspiration and uh, always enjoyed your company. And uh, it was fantastic to hear your stories again. How can people get in touch with you um, if they want to? Um, the uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a classic case of website under construction at the moment, but I'm at um, uh, paulzenon.com. Uh, it's p a u l z e n o n dot com, um, and uh, on Twitter, uh, same at Paul Zenon, um, or on Facebook. Strange enough, cunningly hidden away under Paul Zenon. <laughs> well, thanks for the laughs, Paul, and uh, Thank thanks you. for making lockdown fun. Yeah, Absolute thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Take care. Stay safe. All the best. And thank you, everyone, for listening today. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for listening to From Isolation to Inspiration. If you're interested in working with Bernardo and being coached or mentored by him, you can reach him via www.bernardo-moyer.com. If you're interested in speaking at the Best You Expo, getting involved online or on the Best You TV, please go to www.thebestyou.co.